Welcome back to the Graham Stephan Show. And we got to talk about today the problem with financial independence. Yeah, I didn't realize apparently there's a problem with financial independence. Maybe the problem is, uh, you know, having too much money. Maybe the problem is just not knowing where to spend it. But according to Ramit Sadie, there is a problem with this that we got to discuss. And that brings me to this video here. He just posted this a few days ago. It's titled The Problem with the Fire Movement. And I just want to say Ramit Sadie is someone I really enjoy watching his videos. I like his perspectives. I think he brings up a lot of really great points. And I want to break them down even further today on this episode of make sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done that already. And now with that said, let's begin. Financial independence, retire early. Those words sound great, right? Well, I have some problems with the idea of fire. It sounds great, but is it too good to be true? No, it's really not too good to be true. The only way it's too good to be true is if you expect, like if your life's miserable right now, and then you expect, oh, I'm gonna be happy one day when I'm financially independent. I will say if you're miserable now, you're gonna be miserable with money. If you're miserable with money, you're gonna be just as miserable if you have even more money. Money doesn't solve the problems of you being unhappy with your life. You know, be on the basics, okay? Like if you could afford enough for like a roof over your head, a car to go from A to B, a little money to, you know, have some fun here. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, oh, I want $5 million and I'll be happy. You know, enough will solve the basic, you know, problems and annoyances of life, but beyond that, for the most part, just from what I've overly seen, it's just your personality will be your personality with or without money. It's not going to change things. It's not going to make you happier. Otherwise, you know, the richest people would be the happiest. It's not necessarily the case. Oftentimes, the happiest people making 70,000 a year, great family, have hobbies, have a great social circle, they go out, uh, you know, they, they have passions, they pursue those. Those are often the happiest people. It's not the richest. I remember years ago going on TV to talk about my best selling book, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. They congratulated me on my book, said, oh, great job. Do you have to work anymore? And I sat back and I realized I'd never really put it that way, but no, I don't have to work anymore. Kind of an odd question, right? I mean, it's kind of weird for me because as a, as a finance channel, I love talking about people's personal finances. Like I'll dive right into it. I'll say, oh, you know, what are you invested in? How much do you have in there? Like for me, it's I guess normal. But uh, yeah, to ask someone like, oh, you need to work anymore? It just seems like an odd question to bring up. Oh, well. It's an example of something called the crossover point where your investments earn enough to fund your expenses automatically. And this idea was first described by Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez in their book, Your Money or Your Life. Fantastic book. I highly recommend reading this book. I read this book when I was a teenager, believe it or not. I, I saw it on a bookshelf. It looked really cool. Uh, it was about money. I was all into that. And I read this book. It changed my perspective because it really breaks down how much your time is worth and how much of your life you have to sacrifice for money. Uh, like you going to a nine to five job, let's just say each hour of your time is worth, you know, let's just call it $30, okay? So 50 cents a minute. You're really putting a value on your life. Like your life is worth 50 cents a minute during some of the peak years of your entire life. That's the price. And uh, she breaks down how to optimize that and really make the most of your time without uh, you know, sacrificing too much. It's a really interesting book. I highly recommend reading it. Uh, just go on Amazon, honestly. Maybe you could find like a cheaper version online, buy it pre owned doesn't matter. I highly recommend reading this book. It will change your perspective on money, almost guaranteed. Would highly recommend it. Just, just go and do it. It'll, I'm sure it'll be like 10 bucks, and this is worthwhile. But this really started off the entire financial independence retire early craze because people started saying, wait a second, I'm spending 40, 50 years of my life behind a desk doing something I hate just to spend 20 years of my life maybe being able to be retired if I do everything correctly for 50 years. And in the last 20 years of my life, I can't enjoy it the same way as when I'm younger and have energy. So read this. It's going to help. There's lean fire, which is people who've decided they can live on a lean amount of money, often thirty to $50,000 a year in perpetuity. On the other end of the spectrum, there is fat fire, which is for people who want to live an extravagant life at the highest levels of spending. Uh, so to break it down even further, like lean fire, a lot of these people doing lean fire really love just like do it yourself activities. A lot of them are into camping, taking hikes, just hanging out with friends, playing video games. 
in, in many parts of the country, like you could live very decently well on $40,000 a year. So if you have, you know, hypothetically about a million dollars saved up, give or take, you could do a lean fire, $40,000 a year, almost in perpetuity with very little risk involved, assuming you're properly diversified, 40 grand a year, you know, you're pretty well off. Uh, then you have normal financial independence, which I, I would say is probably a, a post-tax income of sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year. So it's like you replace the average salary for most people. That that's about a two million dollar range. Then fat fires about five million dollars, where you're making about two hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, you know, just a four percent withdrawal rate off that. But then you can also have like barista fire, where maybe you make thirty thousand dollars a year, twenty thousand dollars a year from your investments, and you could take like a part time coffee job, you know, uh, to bridge the difference. So you could kind of work leisurely, you could, you could work on your own schedule for the most part, but you have to bring in a little money just to keep things going. Or you could do coast fire, which is basically where you have enough and you could just coast by and spend your income while letting your investments do the heavy lifting so that like 20 years from now, you're going to be set. So let's just say for coast fire, you have $700,000. Well, if you just leave that be for the next 20 years, earning you know, an average 8% return, you're gonna be pretty well off. So that means from your day job, as long as you don't touch your investments, you could spend a little bit more, it's coast fire. So once you get into it, it's addicting. Like I love the aspect of financial independence, retire early, I think it's super cool. It got me into saving money, living below your means, trying to aggressively invest as much as possible. It's so much fun, the community's fantastic. I highly recommend it. For anyone who vibes with that, Go for it. For example, in 2018, Oprah bought a house for $8 million. Seems outrageously expensive, right? Her net worth at the time was over $4 billion. And if she just conservatively invested that money, her investments alone would generate $160 million that year. Yeah, when you had that much money though, first of all, most of it's tied up in ownership throughout companies. So it's not like she could cash it out. Uh, yeah, theoretically, she probably could. She wouldn't get $4 billion for it, most likely. Maybe she could, okay? She, Oprah's got money coming out of every angle possible. She she probably has money. She goes to sleep, and she wakes up like a million dollars richer every single day. So, like, how do you spend a million dollars a day? It, it, she's got a lot. But, uh, yeah, point being, at that level, it really doesn't matter. You could just be spending money on whatever, and you'll still be making more. It's wild. Now that we know what fire is, Let's break down the problems. Part two, the problems with the FIRE movement. Imagine if he said, uh, it'd be funny if he's like, you know the problems with FIRE is like, it's really difficult to decide between whether you want the Cybertruck or a used Mercedes G-Wagon. Like, like oh, that keeps me up at night to figure out like between the two. Do you go for the stainless steel or do you go for the Mercedes concept that holds its resale value really well, but the Cybertruck is newer. What do you pick? When you're FIRE, it's like, oh, choices. That's the problem. <laughs> Most Americans stretch to save 10%. Fire absolutely obliterates that by showing it's possible to save 25, 40, even 70% of your income if you get clear about your goals. Yeah, for a while, I actually saved 99% of my income. I know it sounds absolutely ridiculous to say, but here's how I did it. I lived in a duplex in Los Angeles, and of the duplexes, of the two units, I lived in the smaller side. I lived in the one bedroom. It was about 900 square feet, and then I built my office in the garage. And the garage would get like 100 degrees in the summer, and I just film at night when it was a little cooler. I rented out the other side, and that other side, paid for all of my ownership expenses when you accounted for the interest on the mortgage, the property taxes, the insurance, all that sort of stuff. So like my living expenses were basically down to zero. And then my income from the investments paid for all of the other things like groceries, car insurance. I had a lease payment at the time, my phone bill, like everything all in was like $1,500 a month for everything. It's like a single person. And so my investments were able to cover that $1,500 a month. And then I saved 100% of what I made as a real estate agent. And then all of that money I made as a real estate agent went back into my investments. And then when the property value went up on the duplex because I renovated it, I did a cash out refinance. I pulled out all of my money in the property. Rents ended up going up at the time. And because of that, I basically got a free place to live in Los Angeles. All of that rent paid for me to live in there for free my investments paid for my expenses, and then I saved 100% of what I made as a real estate agent, 
And that's how I was able to aggressively save as much as possible for about a decade. The FIRE movement is often obsessed with a number. A lot of members of the FIRE movement exhibit classic signs of stress, anxiety, even depression, thinking that hitting some mythical number in their spreadsheet will suddenly make them happy. Yeah, but here's the thing though. I think if you need to have a number. You can't just say like, oh, it's gonna be around here and I don't really, no. So here's how you calculate that number. You look at your living expenses. You look at your overhead. You think, how much do I need to spend every single year to get by? Then you take that number and you multiply it by, we'll call it 30. That's your number right there. So if you spend $50,000 a year, multiply that by 30, and you need $1.5 million invested to be able to sustain $50,000 a year without running out over a 30-year time frame. So that's how you come up with a number. Now, if you think, I am horribly miserable right now, life is awful, I hate every single day, and if I had one and a half million dollars, I'm gonna be gloriously happy. Not quite, it's, it's not gonna be like that. If you're just as anxious, you know, on, on the journey, you're gonna be just as anxious afterwards because then you're gonna think, oh, what if the 1.5 is worth 750? What if the market crashes? What if this happens? I mean, like, you're gonna replace that anxiety and stress with something else. It's what always happens. If you don't solve the underlying problem, you're gonna still have it. Money's not gonna solve that. But that's why I do think the number is really important. And as a goalpost, I think it's important to have like, I want this number, by this time it gives me something to work towards. I don't know. I do well having numbers like that. Another problem is that people working towards fire often spend years living in ultra frugality. I'm talking hyper frugality. So that one day, in this mythical future, they can enjoy their money. But that's not how people work. Okay, so I'm gonna say that's a half truth from my perspective. The half truth is I really enjoy living frugally. Like to spend $1,500 a month in Los Angeles. Like I was using my grocery bags as trash bags because I, I didn't wanna buy trash bags. I mean, I did so many things to save money. Like I would, I would do laundry during off-peak electrical hours because I knew like after 10 p.m. Los Angeles, like the electricity rates go down. I charge the car during the, like I would do so many things to save money, like little bits. And to me, it was like, I'm gonna stack one, stack another, stack another, stack another. Like one thing on its own is not gonna make a difference, but you do a hundred of those things for years. And it amounts to a sizable amount of money. I will say though, that these habits are very hard to break. So when you do actually have the money and you look at the, the number, you hit the number, and you look at the statistics and you say, realistically, I can spend this money and there's no point dying with it, but I can't spend it. It's very difficult to overcome that psychological barrier because you've spent so long not spending the money that spending it becomes very painful. Like even now, um, parting with money on, on something, unless I absolutely love it, like I don't, it brings me pain to spend money. Like, like spending money is not something that brings me joy. What brings me joy is investing it. I love making money and just saving it and putting it away. And that makes me happy. Spending it is just for, I think, I think in my mind, I just associated for such a long time, spending is bad. Don't spend. Spending brings pain. Spending is, you know, it's just don't spend it. Because I was obsessed with hyper frugality, like he said. When you set the goal of accumulating a number, it becomes very difficult to learn how to spend it. In other words, you can't be ultra frugal for years and years and then magically flip a switch and suddenly you are spending money. Yeah, okay, all right. I'll say he's like 80% right on that. But I did truly enjoy saving as much money as possible. Like going back to those days, I gladly do it over again just because it, it, it's fun. Like I, I, it was, to me, it was like a video game of just saying like, oh, if I eat food at home instead of going and doing this, I could save X amount. If I could not go to H&M and buy another shirt and get one secondhand instead, I could save X amount. It's a stupid little thing, but I enjoyed it. Like that to me was fun. Option one, you could cut your monthly expenses in half. Now, a lot of people are like, F off Ramit. You're telling me to cut my monthly expenses in half. Do you know how much it costs? Yes, I get it. It's expensive. But there are also a lot of examples of people in the lean fire community actually doing it. Yeah, I see so many of that. I, I was so big in a lean fire too. When I was doing my $1,500 a month in Los Angeles, like you could rent a room. Uh, instead of renting a whole house for yourself, rent a room. If you're, if you're a single person 
in your 20s, early 30s, it's super simple because everyone else in their 20s or early 30s, they're, they're living with roommates, a lot of them. So you could rent out a room for like $800 a month instead of spending $2,200 a month on rent. So you could save a ton of money right there. Cooking food at home, uh, driving a really inexpensive vehicle that runs well with high mileage. It doesn't need to be anything fancy, just like a used Toyota Prius. Those things are indestructible, they're bulletproof. Uh, you know, there's so many little ways here and there. Uh, take an honest, you know, side hustle, a uh, little part-time job in addition to what you're doing. You, you have so much extra time during the day that people just waste on social media, doing things that aren't productive. There's so many things that you could do to save a ton of money to get your savings rate to like 50% if, you, if you're really into it, it's possible. Please recognize you have the power to dramatically change the way you approach your working years. You can earn more. Learning how to increase your salary is a skill. You can spend less. The FIRE community has shown us it's possible. Or you can do both. You decide on your rich life. Yeah, I you know I agree with him. It really just depends on what you resonate the most with. For me, it was hyper frugality. I'm the type of person I'd rather just get it out of the way sooner than later and just move on than have something hanging over my head. You know, or I guess shoulders. Hanging over your shoulders is the proper term for that. Like, if I know I have a task that I gotta get done a year from now, I don't wanna think about it for the next year. I'm just like, all right, well, I'll just do it now. Get it done with, and then I can relax. Uh, so that's just my personality type. Other people, they don't wanna do that. So uh, whatever keeps you on track is what I am for. With that said, retiring early doesn't always have to be part of FIRE. You can choose to simply become financially independent and then decide what you wanna do. Amazing, so let me know what you guys think down below in the comments section if you agree, if you disagree, if, if you're a fan of Fire too, just let me know down in the comments. I'll also link to Ramit's channel down below in the description as well. I highly recommend checking out his channel. I love his videos, they're just really good. So all of that is down below in the description. Thank you so much and until next time.